with reference to baptism as, as requisite or necessary uh, for the remission of sins, uh, we, have, um, we have addressed the matter of uh, salvation by faith only. Uh, and just, just by way of a quick reminder, uh, the phrase faith only appears only one time anywhere in our Bibles. It's in James chapter 2 and verse number 24 where it says, where you, you see then how that man is justified by works and not by faith only. We looked at uh, the matter of grace, that, that somehow the teaching of, of, the, of the requirement of baptism is in some way a nullification of grace. With the, the, the most common argument is, is that, is, that uh, is from Romans speaking about grace and not works. And we made the connection that there are different kinds of works that are found in the Bible. There are the works of men and there are the works of God. We noted that Noah was saved by grace, Genesis 6 and verse 8. But he was not saved by grace without obeying God. And it wasn't until he obeyed God that grace was appropriated and he was saved, he and his family, from the flood. We noted also the fiery serpents of Numbers chapter 21, uh, where Moses lifted up that brass serpent on a pole. And the Bible says that if a person was bitten by that fiery serpent, they, were, they, would, they lived. That's what it says succinctly. Anyone bit by a serpent, when he looked at, he looked at the, the serpent, he lived. And we know that that was an extension of God's grace and that their obedience was not, uh, was not complete. And for seven days, I don't know if I can make that thing stay up or not. I doubt That is not going to work. So, necessity is the mother of invention. Other than the fact that I'm the only thing in the picture, that's really good. Right there. And so the, the grace of God was not appropriated in the walls of Jericho until they were compassed about. And the Bible describes that event as by faith, the walls of Jericho fell. By faith, they fell after they were encompassed about for seven days. That's a Hebrews 11 and verse number 30. Uh, we noted the blind man of John 9. Uh, who was not healed until he obeyed, uh, until he obeyed uh, the words of Jesus to go and wash uh, in the pool of Siloam. And he said, even he described it, he says, I went and I washed and I received my sight. And then we drew the parallel to, we drew the parallel to the plan of salvation. That man, when he obeys the plan of salvation, is saved by the grace of God. And the grace of God is not appropriated in, in uh, that man's life until he obeys, until he obeys God. And so we talked about those things last, uh, uh, I believe it was last, uh, the last Sunday. Well, not last Sunday because we were at the singing, but the Sunday before. But I want to think about some things, I want to think about some things uh, this evening. And then these are all arguments that you can find online. Everything that I'm talking about is an argument against baptism that you can find uh, I'm going to try to get this thing fixed a little better. That you can find online, and uh, that's a little better, that people use as an argument against the necessity of being baptized in order to be saved. And one of those, uh, one of those is from John 3 and verse 5. And John 3 and verse 5. Now John, and really it's in John 3, 3 to 5. But in particular, verse 5, that water and spirit. The argument comes from the idea of water and spirit. And the argument goes like this. That the water in John 3, 5 is physical birth. Because we sometimes use the word water to describe amniotic fluid, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. And then spirit is spiritual birth, which has nothing to do with water baptism. Now, to answer that in brief, in John 3 and verse 3, Jesus said, unless a man is born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. 
Then Nicodemus asked the question, how can a man, how can a man be born when he is old? He said, can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus said, verily I say to you, unless a man is born of water and spirit, of water and spirit, he cannot see or enter the kingdom of God. Now what we need to understand is this. By the way, the word born is in both texts. Verse 3 is obviously an explanation of verse 5. Jesus gives the teaching in verse 3. Nicodemus obviously does not understand the teaching based on his question in verse 4. So Jesus explains to him what it means to be born again. And it means to be born of water and spirit. And so the entirety, the entirety of verse 5 is an explanation of verse 3. In other words, Jesus is not talking about Jesus is not talking about two births in verse 5. He's not talking about a birth that is physical involving water and a birth that's spiritual that's completely separate from that birth. In other words, he's not talking about a physical birth being born into the world as a human being and then being born spiritually later on in a birth that has nothing to do with water baptism. And we know this for we know this for a number of reasons. Number one, this word born and this word born are both singular. In other words, there's just one birth under consideration. If there were two births, two separate births here in verse 5, the verb would be plural. But it's not, it's singular. So it's a singular birth, which is composed of two elements, water and spirit. It's one birth of water and spirit. And it's a very it's a very limited explanation or, or illustration. But if we were talking about a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, how many sandwiches is that? Is it two sandwiches? How many sandwiches is it? One. It's one sandwich, and there's two elements involved, right? Peanut butter and jelly. And if you don't have jelly, you don't have a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. If you don't have peanut butter, you don't have a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. You've got a peanut butter sandwich or a jelly sandwich. But it takes both of them. It takes both of them to have a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Now, this is why this is so important for us, uh, for us to understand. Because, and I can't remember, we, we, we talk about various verses in so many of our classes that I can't remember, that I can't remember if it was a Wednesday night class or Sunday night class. Or, but it's vitally important for us to understand that to be scripturally baptized, biblically baptized, involves both water and spirit. And any... Any baptism that is not done in accordance with the Scriptures of necessity cannot be in, 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 uh, in spirit and in truth. In other words, it can't be... In other words, if a person is not baptized the way the Bible says to do it, for the purpose that the Bible says to do it, on the person that, upon whom it says to do it, then that's not biblical baptism. That's just water immersion. That's just water, we could call it water baptism, but it's not Bible baptism. It's not Bible baptism. All right? And, and the reason that's important is, is that any baptism that's not done, first of all, on a person who understands the gospel, we have to hear and understand the, the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing the Word of God. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved, Mark 16. So the person has to have the capability to hear the gospel, understand the gospel, and believe the gospel in order to be a fit candidate to be baptized. And then they also have to understand the, what baptism is, the nature of it. It's not sprinkling water on a person. It's not pouring water on a person. It's the immersion of the individual in water. All right? And then the purpose of that has to also be understood. It is to receive the remission of sins. 
Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. Acts 2 and verse 38. In other words, unto. There's repentance and baptism that brings the remission of sins. You know, in Acts 22, 16, Saul of Tarsus, actually at that time was already known as Paul, but in recounting his own conversion, he said, here's what I was told by Ananias. And now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized to what, to what purpose? And wash away your sins calling on the name of the Lord. And so even in, in speaking of his own baptism, Paul said his baptism, the purpose of it, was to receive the forgiveness of his sins or to wash away his sins. And now that's what, and the reason this is so important is, is we were talking, I remember now it was last Wednesday night, we were talking about Romans 6 and the nature of baptism in Romans 6, 3 through 5. And how that the baptism brings about the death of the person. The person is not dead until he's baptized. That we're, ba we're buried with him by baptism into death. So baptism brings about the death. The death to sin and the death of sin. And he's raised in newness of life. And so with that baptism in mind, in Romans 8 and verse 14 and following, Paul writes, The Spirit testifies with our spirit that we are the children of God. And we made the point, it doesn't matter what I say. In other words, I can't just bear witness of myself that I'm a child of God. Because there's a lot of people who profess to be children of God, right? But indeed, they are not children of God. The Word of God confirms that we are the children of God. That's how the Spirit testifies to that fact. And so it doesn't matter if my mama thinks I'm a Christian, or if my daddy thinks I'm a Christian, or, or my preacher thinks I'm a Christian, or my spouse, or my friends, or people in town. It doesn't matter if they think I'm a Christian. It doesn't, and it doesn't matter if every one of them bear witness to, the, to their idea that a person is a Christian. There's only one witness that counts. And that's the witness of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit bears witness by the things that are written in the book. So, to get back to, to, get back to this, when a person is... And, and the reason I mention that is this. When I deal with a lot of, when I deal with a lot of my friends that, that practice water baptism, but not in order to be saved or for the remission <laughs> of sins, invariably they'll come back to, well, I was baptized. You know, they want to argue. They want to argue that baptism is not necessary for salvation. And then, when you show them that it is necessary for salvation, then they go to, "Well, I was baptized. So, what about that?" Well, did you did you believe what the Bible teaches when you were baptized? But apparently not, because you didn't think baptism was necessary for remission of sins. Because Colossians two eleven and twelve says, "We're buried with him by baptism and raised through faith in the work of God." who raised him from the dead, being then freed from all trespasses. That's Colossians 2, 11, 12, and 13. And so the point then is this. So you were immersed. But if you weren't immersed the way the Bible talks about being immersed, for the reason that the Bible says to be immersed, the water element, the water element is certainly present, right? I mean, there's no denying the water element is present. But the spirit element cannot be present because it's not in keeping with the Word of God. And so when we talk to people about being born of water and spirit, it's one birth wherein the water and the spirit are both a part, are both a part of that process. All right? For you know, what we've just witnessed tonight, you know, when Moriah was, was immersed in water, the water element was there, and then there was also present. In her, in her mind that I have to do this to obey God in order to be saved. And, now, and by the way, that's why we did it essentially as soon as they got home today. You know, you know, we, didn't wait, we didn't wait until the end of the services because it's the most important thing a person can do. And we want to show how important it is by as soon as she gets here, we're going to, get, we're going to gather everything up and we're going to get this done right away. 
Because the Bible teaches that nobody ever ate, slept, or drank from the time they understood the, 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 the demands of the gospel until they were baptized. Never find anywhere in the Bible anybody saved and baptized two weeks later or two months later or not at all. You know, there, wasn't, you know, there wasn't a whole bunch of people being saved and as soon as we can gather up enough people to make it worth our time, we'll have a baptism service. That's completely foreign to the Scriptures. Every baptism, performed, every baptism performed in the New Testament was performed at the moment those people believed in the gospel of Jesus Christ and recognized their lost condition. And why is that? Because you've got to be baptized in order to be saved. Again, we go back to Romans 6, 3 to 5. We're buried with Him by baptism into death. And then verse 7 says, For he who has died is freed from sin. Well, when did he die? In baptism. When was he freed from sin? When he died. And when did he die? In baptism. So the Bible is clear that baptism frees us from sin when, it's obeyed, when we do it in a keeping with the Word of God. Now, I want to make mention of something that a friend of mine uh, noted because I, I, put, I had a post on my Facebook page uh, late last week that said, Baptism for the remission of sins is an act of faith and not of human merit. Now, our religious friends will tell you that baptism is a work of human merit, right? That's what they'll tell you. It's a work of human merit. But it can't be because a human didn't come up with it. It didn't originate with humans. Now, here's what I want, here's what I want to draw, draw a parallel. Let me ask you a question. And it's kind of a trick question. But it's kind of a trick question to make you think. Alright? Were the Jews, were the Jews in the first century obligated to obey John's baptism? Were they obligated to do it? Were, they were the Jews in the first century obligated to obey John's baptism? Now before you answer, I'm going to ask you a question. And I'm going to ask you the same question that Jesus asked those men in Matthew 21 who said, by what authority do you do these things and who gave you this authority? And he said, I will ask you a question and if you answer my question, then I will answer your question. And here was his question. The baptism of John, where did it come from? Heaven or men? And what was their response to that? They huddled up over there and they said, if we say from heaven then he's going to ask us what? Why didn't you do it? And if we say from men, we fear the people because all the people hold John to be a prophet. Now let me ask you this question. The baptism of John, where did it come from? Heaven or men? Heaven, right? I mean, didn't John say in John chapter 1, he that sent me to baptize gave me these instructions and told me that I would see the one who's to come after me. Didn't John say that? Didn't John say that God himself sent John to baptize? All right, so, was the first century Jew obligated to obey John's baptism? He was. He was obligated. To obey John's baptism and to refuse to be baptized by John was to sin. Is that right? If John's baptism was from heaven, and it was, then anybody who refused to be baptized by John or his disciples sinned. Let me ask you this question. Why did Jesus obey the baptism of John? That's right. He was a Jew and that baptism was sent from heaven. And, as it be, and, and being sent from heaven, he had to obey it to fulfill all righteousness. Yeah, because the psalmist said, all thy commands are righteousness. 
So Jesus obeyed the baptism of John, not because he needed to be remitted of sins, but because the baptism of John came from heaven. And Jesus was obligated as a Jew, as a man, a Jewish man, to obey the command of God given through John to be baptized. Let me ask you this. In the first century, was a Jew required to receive the baptism of John to be forgiven of sins? Open your Bibles to Mark chapter 1 verse 4. That, now you're in Acts 19. You're in Acts 19. I need you in Mark 1 verse 4. Then I'll get you to Mark. Then I'll get you to Acts 19. Somebody open up your Bible to Mark 1 verse 4. Then came John. Now, now this is off the top of my head, all right? But check me how close I am. Make sure I'm right. Then came John from the wilderness of Judea preaching baptism for the remission of sins. Is that right? Is that what it says? Am I pretty close? Pretty close. Am I close enough to do what to what I said concurs with what Mark 1 4 said? Ethan, do you double check me, bro? Yeah. All right, thank you. Was I pretty close? <coughs> All right, but I, but I got it. I got the sense of it, right? Same baseline. Same baseline. Thank you, <laughs> sir. He was preparing the way of the Lord by baptizing for the remission of sins. Now, what 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 did the baptism of Jesus bring? Same thing, remission of sins. Yes, ma'am. Did John have to be baptized? I would assume the answer to that is yes. I would assume the answer to that question is yes. Jesus had to well, he didn't have to. And we all and because we know that John had disciples who also baptized during his ministry. I mean, because we can go to Acts 18 and talk about Apollos, right? You know, Apollos. John wasn't the only one that baptized. No. No, because Jesus was baptizing too, right? No, I meant John didn't have to perform the baptism. That's right. John was not required himself to perform the baptism because there's never been emphasis given to the person who does the baptizing. Never is there any emphasis in the Bible. In John's baptism or the baptism of the Great Commission, who baptizes you is of absolutely no consequence. There's never, it's always on the person who's being baptized and the purpose for which they're being baptized. Look, I need to be baptized by you and you're coming to me. So John understood, but he was talking about the relationship between him and Jesus, not the fact that he needed to be baptized for remission of sins by Jesus. Sean. That's it. And the other one's looking back. That's right. And that gets us to Acts 19. Acts 19 in Ephesus. Paul came to Ephesus and said, Finding certain disciples, he said to them, Have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? They said, We've not heard whether there be any Holy Spirit. He said, Under what then were you baptized? You notice how he just assumed they'd been baptized? Under what then were you baptized? They said, John's baptism. They said, well, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying that you should believe on him who is to come after, that is, on Christ. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, as Sean said, the baptism of John was, was practiced looking forward to the sacrifice of Christ. The baptism of the Great Commission is a baptism that looks backward to the sacrifice of Christ. And so, there, the, so there's one distinction between them. Also, the baptism of John has no connection to the Holy Spirit. Whereas the baptism of Jesus has a direct connection to the Holy Spirit. Go, it says, go and teach all nations or make disciples of all nations, Matthew 28, 19. Baptizing them into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, we don't have to say that. That's not some 
kind of creedal statement that has to be made. For example, when, uh, when Mariah made her confession tonight, I could have slammed her under the water right then, right? Once she made her confession, she's a fit candidate to be baptized. Is that right? I don't have to say anything, right? So why did I say what I said, John? Why did I say, based on your confession, I now baptize you into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of your sins? Why do I say that? Well, number one, to teach all the young people that are here the purpose of baptism. You know, you know, you know Max and you know, Owens, you know, some of the, you know, some of these young guys need, you know, they need they need to start hearing these things. That baptism is into the Trinity or into a relationship with the Trinity and for the remission of sins. Now I don't have to say that. But it helps with the association. And it helps everybody that's in the audience understand what's going on. You know, for example, if, if, somebody, if somebody were witnessing that baptism that didn't understand that baptism was for the purpose of receiving the remission of sins, I don't want them to leave tonight with the wrong idea about why I baptized her. I don't want them to leave thinking that she got saved last week and I just baptized her tonight because she's home from CYC. I want everybody to know. I want my young, I want my young people to, to know. I want them to see it. And it continues to serve as a reminder to all of us as to the purpose of baptism. And so the baptism of John, the baptism of John is key to understanding why baptism is necessary today. Again, the baptism of John, where did it come from? Heaven or men? All right, now let me ask you this. When a person obeyed the baptism of John, were they performing a work of human merit? No. What were they doing? They were obeying what God told them to do, right? Because the baptism of John came from heaven. It came from God. And by the way, it's in... Uh, oh, is it in Luke 7? In verses 28 and 29 that says, They justified God being baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees rejected the will of God for themselves not being baptized by John. Is that right? Is it Luke, is it Luke 7? 28, 29 right in there somewhere? 28, 29, 30. So what, what were they saying? When they justified God, they were, they were declaring, God is right to tell us to do this, and therefore we're going to do it. And then the people that didn't do it, what? Rejected the will of God for themselves, not being baptized. By John. So now let's pull this thing over into the, the Great Commission, into the, into the church age. Immersion in water to receive the remission of sins. Is it from heaven or men? It's from heaven. Just like John's baptism was from heaven, right? And if John's baptism was from heaven, people were obligated to obey it, right? And it was thus not ever a work of human merit. So then, if the baptism of the Great Commission... By the way, who's, you know, who's the first one to give the command to baptize people under the Great Commission? Who was the first person to give that command? Jesus. Yeah. Now, Peter was the first one to give it to... Yeah, at the Sermon on the Mount. I'm not sermon, at the Sermon on Pentecost. But Jesus was the first one that gave it, Right? He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. And he that believes not shall be condemned. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. See, Jesus was the one who told the, Jesus was the one that told Peter what to say on the day of Pentecost. So therefore, that baptism that Peter preached was from where? Heaven. And if it's from heaven, who's obligated to obey it? Everybody. Everybody is obligated to obey it. And so understanding some things about the baptism of John can be crucial and helpful to understanding the baptism of the Great Commission. If obeying John's baptism was not a work of human merit, then obeying the Great Commission baptism given by Jesus cannot be a work of human merit. In other words, you, you, you can't... Because if you try to make that argument against the baptism of the Great Commission, you got to make it against the baptism of John. And yet the baptism of John was an act of faith, wasn't it? 
Looking for the coming of the Christ. For remission of sins, looking for the coming of the Christ. For, for the Great Commission, it's a baptism for the remission of sins, looking back to the coming of the Christ. And when I say the coming of the Christ, I mean the, everything that He did. His life, His death, His burial, and His, re, and his uh, resurrection. Alright, so... Uh, now I want to make I want to make just a uh, a couple of observations here from things that I found online in ar that were arguments against uh, uh, bab the necessity of baptism, and that and this tells you how desperate how desperate people get in this matter. And this is on the uh, it's c a r m dot org. It's the Christian Apologetics Resource Ministry. I think is what it is, but it's c a r m dot org. I believe. And here's what they said. If you teach that baptism is necessary for the remission of sins, then there's no such thing as deathbed conversion. That was their argument. Now, is that statement right? It is right, isn't it? It is right. What's their point, though? We think deathbed conversion is necessary or, or, or permissible. And if you teach baptism is necessary for the remission of sins, you're nullifying our hope in deathbed conversion. By the way, can anybody turn to the passage in the New Testament and give me an example of a deathbed conversion? Can we, can we find such? Now, now I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to tread lightly here. I'm going to tread lightly here. Right. That's right. If, if deathbed conversion is legitimate, then every person has their own right to declare their own salvation. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. But let me just, let me just go back to the argument out. Well, you know, what if they died on the way to the church? Here's somebody who wants to be baptized and they die on the way to the church before they can be baptized. What do you say about that? Here's what I say. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. That's what I say. That's all I'm at liberty to say. But here's what else I would say. Genesis 18, 9 says, The judge of all the world will do right. If God, in His infinite wisdom, decided to save that individual, that is 100% His prerogative, right? But I can't preach it. Because I don't, as, as Micaiah said in 1 Kings twenty two fourteen, as the Lord liveth and speaks, that's what I'm going to say. So I'd never preach that a person could be saved by deathbed conversion or be saved if they died on the way to the baptistry. But if God, if God wants to do that, God's in the saving business, right? But I can only say what the Bible says. And then I'll add to that this. The exception does not make a rule. The exception does not make a rule. In other words, if I, even if I were to grant that I believe that God would save that person, that does not eliminate the rule. And what's the rule? The rule is, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But again, I would never preach that that person was saved. I'd just say the judge of all the world will do right. Abraham believed that. And that's why, and that's why he said it. And so, and so the idea of deathbed conversions or die, you know, and, and of course there, here's another thing you, can, you know, you know, while we're, you know, while people are what if, and you can start taking them what ifs and start toting them backwards. Well, what if, what if an atheist was on his way to a gospel meeting where he's going to hear the most powerful sermon on the gospel of Christ that's ever been preached, a sermon that would certainly prick his heart. And cause him to want to obey the gospel. But he died in a car wreck on his way to the gospel meeting. Now, let me ask you this. Will our religious friends and neighbors say that an atheist can be saved? Will they make the exception for the atheist? Not likely. Is that right? Not likely. But is there a nickel's worth of difference in my example and their example? Not one nickel's worth. 
Not a nickel's worth of difference in those two examples. And so, you know, while you, when people want a what if, you can start carrying that what, what if backwards, backwards, till eventually somebody, somebody's going to crack. In other words, somebody is not, somebody is not going to accept that. All right? Now, let me just mention this real quick, Sean. A hardcore Calvinist would say, a hardcore Calvinist might say, well, he was predestined to be saved, but he just got killed before he had a chance to be saved which is totally inconsistent because if he's predestined to be saved, then he's also predestined to live long enough to obey. All right, Sean. I was just going to say it. Now, deathbed confession is different than a deathbed conversion. If you have a person who is an erring child of God, they, and maybe they come Thank you for mentioning that, I, and I appreciate that. That's right. You know, a, a person who is an erring child of God might come to their senses realizing that the end is near and, and, and repent and confess their sins, but they do so as a child of God and not as an alien sinner because only children of God have the right to ask for forgiveness. In other words, that right belongs only to God's children, those who have obeyed the gospel. Here's another quick objection. Okay, you going to say something? It is. Got your get out of jail free card. Yeah. And right. That's right. The man is, is in the process of obeying God. The fact he's going to die in the party is one of those ignorant things. Yeah, because, God, because by the way, I've been, I've been in this line of work for 30 years and nobody has ever given me the example of the guy that died in the car wreck. It's, all theor it, it's been theoretical for 30 years in my lifetime of ministry. Nobody's ever produced a single example of that actually happening, Right? Yeah, and I, I'm I'm of the same mindset, Vince. I'm of the same mindset that uh, uh, that, that they're going to get there. Now, I just I believe that. I believe that, and this is different. And I'll give you an example of this. Uh, guy used to hold meetings here years ago. Daryl Davis used to preach at uh, Petersville up in the Florence area. Preached up there for years and years and years. His dad rejected the gospel for years and years and years. His dad was in the hospital. And called Daryl and said, I want to be baptized in the morning. And Daryl said, no, Dad. said, you need to be baptized tonight. He said, this is too important to put off till tomorrow. And his dad said, no. He said, it's too much trouble. He said, we'll get everything arranged and I'll be baptized in the morning. And guess what happened that night? He died. He died. You know, you know I, can't hold out any, I can't hold out any hope for that individual. You know, I, you know, again, the, the judge of all the world will do right. But you know, you're talking about a person who has reject, openly rejected the gospel for years and years and years and years and has opportunity and then fails to exercise the opportunity that God gave him and died. And again, that's a different situation altogether than the one that we're talking about. And then there's another objection is, if baptism is... And by the way, all these... All these or say many of these objections are all, or I should say all, all of these objections are based in religious error. In other words, they believe something wrong, and therefore they are arriving at a wrong conclusion, then draw a wrong argument. Again, C A R M in their list. If if immersion is required to be saved, then babies go to hell. That babies that die go to hell. So again, what's the problem? Babies are not lost. In other words, they've got a wrong conclusion about the nature of man, that all men are in some, some way born tainted with Adam's sin. And because of that misunderstanding, now they've drawn the conclusion, well, certainly babies can't be lost, so therefore baptism cannot be necessary. 
And they don't understand what the Bible teaches about the nature of man. You know, man is not born tainted with Adam's sin or, or stained with Adam's sin. You know, Jesus likened those that were converted to little children, except you be converted and become like little children. You will in no wise enter you know, the kingdom of heaven. You know, Suffer the little children to come unto me and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. So we understand there are three, state, there are three states of humanity. There's lost, there's saved, and there's safe. Safe. And little children are safe. They're not saved. Because in order to be saved, you've got to be lost. They've never been lost. So there's lost and saved and safe. That's what I preached at Mr. Avery's funeral back in 2018. Uh, the, Scott, you remember him, the mentally retarded man at the, at the nursing home. And I preached that. I said, that he's safe. He's safe. He's never been lost. He's always had the mind of a child. Never had the ability to understand the will of God and, and to disobey it. He's, you know, he's just as pure as a driven snow. And I think it, I think it, made, a, I think it made an impression on a lot of people you know, to, to talk about that there's a, safe, there's a safe state in addition. Now here's, here's one that, that really gets me. And I'm gonna, I'll, I'll mention this one, then I'll... I'll uh, well, if I get, I'll mention this one quickly and then one more. It says, Baptism is in Acts 2.38, but it's not in Acts 3.19. Open your Bibles, Acts 2.38. Acts 2.38. Acts 2.38. Verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made this same Jesus, whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. And when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Do. What shall we do? And Peter said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Now, Either on that same opening or on the next opening is Acts 3 and verse 19. Where the same man preaching in Acts 2 is also preaching in Acts 3. And he says, repent therefore and what? Be converted that your sins might be blotted out. Now, think about that. In 2.38... We have repent, baptism equals remission of sins. In 319, we have repent, be converted, sins blotted out. These two things are the same. And these two things are the same. So then what, what do we know? Beyond a shadow of a doubt. That these two things have to be the same. Right? I mean, look at it like this. We're just going to do a little math problem here. Right? My apologies for people who hate math. But Hunt will appreciate it because he loves math. All right? A plus B equals C. Alright? A plus X equals C. What do we know? What even? X and B are equal. They're the same thing. When you add it to A, it gives you the same answer. So, we, obviously these are the same, and obviously these are the same, which means we know of necessity these two things have to be the same. I mean, it's, it's simple, right? So, when you get repent and be baptized for the remission of sins, and repent and be converted, that your sins are blotted out, we understand that the two things in the middle are the same. Baptism is conversion, that's right. It's when you're converted from an old man to a new man. That's right. You go in as an old man and come out as a new man. That's exactly right. I don't have time to deal. I have one more, but time's going 
done got got away from us, uh, and we might we may come back to it, uh, or we may not. But uh, I think we've I think we've pretty well handled this over the last three or four sessions. Any questions about anything that's been said tonight? I don't want to get out of here without anybody. You know, I always want to be clear. That's why I use this board. You know, it helps us to you know to hear it and to see it and put these things together. All right, let me turn this off.